We've got uh, Nick in Madison. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Matt, John, and Hector. Oh, now you're actually on. Sorry, Nick. Okay, no problem. How are hey. you doing? Hey, Nick. Doing well. Hey, good. Um, like I told the call screener, um, I, uh, I've been religious most of my life. Um, I've been having questions lately. I'm 41 years old. Um, the biggest thing that I can't get past is the first cause that Thomas Aquinas put forth. Um, and um, I know you've talked about this on the show before. I know. But I'm just trying to get past that. I can't get past that. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's assume for just a second that there must have been a first cause. I'll just okay. grant the argument that concludes, therefore, there must have been a cause. What do we know okay. about what do we know about that cause? We don't know anything about it. Yeah. So you don't even know whether it's an agent or a god. So the first mm -hmm. cause argument couldn't possibly be the thing that keeps somebody believing in God because the first cause argument doesn't argue for a god necessarily. Because it, we're already here. It's it's just that basically we reach the the answer hey we don't know what started it all off or even if that's the right way to do it um but people been proposing a god and so this god became uh just by sheer weight of popularity a seemingly plausible explanation that's not actually plausible so if you acknowledge that even if there's a first cause you don't know anything about it that can't be the thing that keeps you believing in god because it doesn't get you there Well, okay, and again, like, like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to argue. I'm just trying to talk. Um, Either works for me. Oh, okay. Um, and first of all, I love the show. You guys are great. Thank you. Um, but when you say you can't get there, um, I... Although now that I think about it, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, what I've, I have done research and uh, I've read about particle physics where things just pop in and out of existence, you know? Okay. Um, so something can come from nothing. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any nothing that we could actually d use to demonstrate that with. I'm not aware that there ever has been or could be uh, a nothing. And by the way, even saying a nothing uh, makes it something. So what physicists are talking about w when you listen to somebody like Lawrence Krauss or whoever talking about a universe from nothing, they're not talking about mm -hmm. nothing in the same context that philosophers would, would talk about nothing. They're talking about a, a quantum state where there's zero effective energy across the system type of thing. They're, they're talking, what they're talking about is a something. Uh, Although I know Lawrence would argue with me on that, but it's definitely not the same thing as, you know, the ex nihilo nothing from philosophy. Mm -hmm. No, and, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. But, too. but this, is, this um, is the thing is that it doesn't matter. It didn't even, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't matter if we'd proved that, let's say, something could come from nothing, or if we just had physics models that seem to imply that something could come from the thing that we would typically kind of colloquially refer to as nothing. None of that matters because at the end of the day, even, even when we didn't know any of that, the correct answer mm -hmm. to why is there something rather than nothing is, I don't know. And what's happening, is, as Hector was pointing out earlier, is that that answer is so uncomfortable for people that we have come up with explanations, and some of them have gotten quite popular, and yet none of them have any justification for believing that they're the right answer. It's just... We didn't have a way to investigate this. We got really tired and frustrated and having to say, gosh, I don't know why there's something. It must be God. And that's not the mm -hmm. way reason works. That's, that's an incredibly unsound epistemology to say, well, we're so smart and we've done so much research that we should really know this by now. And the fact that we don't know this by now really amplifies my discomfort at not knowing. So I'm going to go with God. Mm -hmm. and, and I completely understand that. Like, you know, the arg argument from uh, incredulity where, you know, yeah. I don't see how God, I, I don't see how this happened. God did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to be that, but 
I'm yeah, I'm not. I'm not remotely implying that me stating this mm-hmm. is going to make you go, "Oh, of course, I was so silly." I let me. Yeah. Of course, I don't. But it, but it is something to think about. And 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 the most important thing is, I, I would guess, because this is typical of almost everybody that I talk to in the in this realm, is that you have the same discomfort with acknowledging that you don't know the answer. Um, mm-hmm. And that takes work to get comfortable saying, I don't know. And for me, it's, it's one of the best things you can possibly say because if you pretend like you know when you don't, then mm-hmm. you stop looking for the right answer and you have no hope of ever getting... Why would you keep looking for the right answer if you think you already have it? And so the second you and, acknowledge you don't know what the answer is, that allows you to go out and keep exploring. And I completely understand that because, um, you know, I grew up and um, I'm not going to disparage my parents because they're great people. I mean, just awesome people. Um, but I grew up, you know, believing that the world was 6,000 years old. And then I went to college, then it I joined the Marines. And, and I learned that, um, no, it's not. It's it, it is. It's just older. It's billion years old. Yes, it's just yeah. at least 6,000 years old. It's a lot older than that. Yep, I'm sorry. I was... Joke yeah. while you were being serious, my fault. No, oh, oh, okay, sorry. No, um, no, I grew up believing that, and then I learned something different um, just on my own by researching by on my own. Yeah, the thing that you have to exercise caution about is you believed one thing until you were convinced of a better answer. And so what a lot of people are doing with you know, the God thing is they believe it, they become convinced of it for bad reasons, the same way all of us did, but they're reluctant to give it up until there's a better answer. And for these big questions where we don't necessarily have a better answer, um, mm-hmm. that becomes a sticking point. It, it's not so much, it's, it's not even truly a, a, a fallacy. It, it's something that we normatively do. I'm convinced that, um, that Hector's a good guy. Now, we don't know each other all that well, but all, the interactions that I've had with him have been positive. I would need somebody to show me that he's not a good guy in order for me to change my mind. That's the way we generally think of like a burden of proof or a burden of evidence is I'm going to stick with what I and already. Kevin, I, I believe you're a good guy, too, you know, without well, evidence. You know? I can prove that wrong really quick. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but I'm just assuming. No, I, yeah. the, the, the point is that if in most cases if you believe something and then you're shown to be wrong because you got a, the, the right answer or a better answer that's how we change our mind uh, mm-hmm. you, what, what we have to do is become comfortable with the notion that just because we have an answer and we don't have a better one does not mean that we were right to accept the first answer as a matter of fact probability alone would suggest that you were almost certainly wrong to accept the first answer that you were presented Actually, would you say then maybe, you know, we're not right to accept the second answer? We still have to look. Well, that's the thing is that all the things that we discover, I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain about anything. Every position I have is tentative based on new or better Not Nor evidence. am I anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you know, it's probability based. And my confidence level, a la Hume, uh, I try to make proportional to the evidence that supports an idea. So my confidence level that there, there's a God is pretty much zero. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, uh, sometimes I, I I hear these arguments, and I just I just wonder if the 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 concern is not an evidential one, if it's an emotional one. You know, how much do people get stuck on this? Well, but we can't really explain the origins of the universe yet. How much is that really intellectual versus? Okay, if I really embrace this, it means that I'm going back into the earth forever. And there's no purpose to this, and that's really terrifying. That's really previ- that's really getting people mm-hmm. stuck on that question. And that's that's actually something that's actually something else that you can show to be um, highly improbable. So mm-hmm. yes, uh, I'm I'm worried about you know the potential of not having an explanation for this, et cetera. But if we in much the same way that the first cause argument doesn't necessarily get you to a God you know anything about, even if you went with it just because it's uh, comforting, just because it you know, makes you feel less anxious about not knowing what the answer is, or if you're doing what Hector was talking about, which was 
this may get me other things as well. And it, the problem is, is that you've begun with something that's flawed and now you're about to slide down a slippery slope into maybe not all the way to fundamentalist, you know, conservative stuff, but you're going to end up believing a bunch of other things that are potentially flawed. And to do that after you've acknowledged that even if the first cause got us to a God, you know nothing about that God's characteristics. So now you're in a position where you believe in a God, but you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it wants. You don't know whether or not it can benefit you, whether or not it will benefit you. So it's kind of just, I'm going to cling to this in the hopes that maybe it can benefit me. And that's, that's kind of like hanging on to not just a, a, a lottery ticket after the drawing that didn't win, but hanging on to a fake lottery ticket after the drawing that didn't win. <laughs> No, I, I understand that, and I don't want to keep you guys, you know, you know, too long because I know you have a limited amount of time. But um, what I'm saying is, like, you know, I'm having these feelings, I'm having these thoughts, and I'm thinking about these things, and you know, basically everything that I was brought up to believe is wrong. Welcome to the club. That, that that's a big deal. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it is. I mean, it is. Yeah. yeah, I don't mean to be glib. I, it's yeah. frightening. It was not a. It was not like one day I woke up and said, "Wow, all that stuff's wrong," and I feel so much better. Ultimately, I did feel a lot better. I have uh, more freedom. I have more confidence in, in what I believe. But it's never, mm -hmm. or almost never, a trivial thing. And for some people, it's much more difficult than others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, um, you know, my, you know, I haven't. You know, I know, Matt, you, you uh, came out to your family as an atheist. That's fine. I haven't come out to my family at all. And I don't know when I will because, um, let's be honest, you know, my parents are old. I have this much time with them. Yep. I want to make my time with them happy. Yep. You know? Yeah. There's no reason to tell them that. And that's why most of the time, even though they know, uh, most of the time I don't talk religion with my parents. I did on this last trip home for like six hours mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I got there. Uh, I like got to my mom's house at 4.30. She fed me, and at 5.30 we started talking and didn't stop till like 11.30. But that's the only time that we've had that conversation. And there were good things that came out of it, and there were not so good things that came out of it. It was the first day of the week that I spent there, and all the rest of the week was fine um, mm -hmm. because, you know, yeah, yeah, they think I'm, you know, actively working for Satan and and out to destroy God's wonderful plan. Um, but well, they love I, I, me. I, 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 I don't think my, my mom and dad would, my mom and dad would never think that. I mean, they would just, you know, think that I needed to be, you know, guided somewhere else, basically. Right. Um, right. You just don't want to cause them distress in their last days by coming out to them, right? Yeah. That's basically, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're in their 70s. I mean, come on. It, what, why would I want to do that? I, I'll tell you something that I was, wasn't really going to talk about, and I'll keep this brief. Um, okay. I have one remaining grandparent. She's uh, 91. And uh, without getting into the specifics, something was said about whether or not I was going to be coming back to Jesus and how she had hoped that she would see that before her time on earth is over. Um, okay. I, I don't like to lie. I think there are often good times to lie. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure if my grandmother was, I mean, she's fine. Um, we had a good time. We played cards. But if she was actually on her deathbed and desperately wanted to know that I had come back to Jesus before she was, you know, moving on to meet him in person, um, I don't know if I would lie or not. I would like to think that I wouldn't lie. On the other hand, I don't know that I have any real objection to doing it. Uh, well, I'll tell you right now that, you know, in that case, you know, in that scenario, I would flat out lie. Yeah, it's, some, it's something I considered. I, I can't say until I'm in the situation. When she died, you know? Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. But you bring up an interesting point. People live long. You may have to hold that secret for 20 certain, you know, 20 odd years. That's burdensome mm -hmm. as well. Not only that, what about all the people who are younger than you who care about you who are bothered by this as well? Right. So you're going to... I, I, I know. And, and, and that's... Right. Like, that's a great point. It's not only thing. about the you know, older I, generations. I have, oh. I have, it's not just the older generations. You know, I have, you know, nieces. I have uh, brother and sister-in-law who I love to death. I love them all to death. 
Um, they all go to a evangelist church, um, which is great. It's fine. They love it. I mean, it's great for them. Um, but I just don't believe it. And I don't want to. It's, they're their kids. Yeah. I don't want to get in the way of their kids, you know? Everybody knows about me. My niece and my nephew know about me uh, and have. And I, and I told my brother early on, I'm always going to be honest with them. And if they ask questions or if I give answers that are uh, uncomfortable or what you don't like, I'm always going to finish the conversation with, but there are many views on this. You should go talk to your dad and you should think for yourself. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah it's, you, basically, you're no, describing... I, 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 Nick, you're describing that you're a decent human being who cares about others. Yeah, and and but you never know. You never know how many people, how many young people may be agonizing over the same things that you're agonizing over, and you come out like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, thank you, Uncle, for saying this. You know, because I was thinking this too. I've had that experience. Thought myself. I was the only one in the whole family who felt like this, and now I have yeah. somebody I can talk to at you yeah. know Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, they're like you know seven and five right now but you know maybe later you know many years later you know we can talk about this but it's a uh, it's a quandary and i wouldn't i wouldn't fault you for for... i'm not i'm not i'm not getting it unless they bring it up i'm not bringing it up but there's no requirement that you have to broadcast your doubts to the world just Mm -hmm. because you have them you know you you can be judicious in what you reveal to Mm -hmm. who and when so Mm -hmm. you know at at the end of the day it's you what you're comfortable presenting yourself as and you have to kind of mm-hmm. keep that balance but yeah as, as you run into more you know difficulties or questions by all means you can call uh, us back you can call talk heathen you can call uh shows but also look for some people in your community that you know have gone through similar things there's plenty of organizations out there um where you can mm-hmm. at least interact at some level that you're comfortable with with people who have also have either found their way out of religion or in the process of doing so or expressing doubts. And uh, some of them are going to have much better uh, thoughts and advice than any of us are going to have because they're going to be in a situation that's potentially more similar to yours than, than ours was. No, absolutely. And I appreciate that. And uh, Matt, I appreciate, I appreciate that in this whole call, you didn't say no, 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 no. Okay. (laughs) Gosh, that's tempting. (laughs) (laughs) I will resist the temptation. Thanks a lot for the call, Nick. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, have a good day. Me too. Thanks. I haven't heard you say that in a long time. <laughs> I think Julie keeps it going more than I do um, on, on Facebook. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, well, I'm not going to go into the thought processes behind how I and why I make the decisions because I'm not going to pretend to know myself quite that well. It just, yeah. um, I think that what ends up happening on the show a lot is you're going to get different calls. Um, and I try to make sure that people get as good as they give. And so if somebody's willing to have a conversation and, and you can maintain calm. Well, then, you know, it's, it's like I smoked a bowl before the show. And if they're a little bit more um, dishonest in conversation, well, then, you know, somebody once called me Bill O'Reilly on PCP. I'm not sure which <laughs> show they were watching. Because I don't think I've quite ever been. Wow. Uh, yeah, that phrase stuck with me. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was kind of amusing. <laughs>